Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're so happy that you could join us uh, this nice Saturday to come hear the words of our important civil rights pioneers today. I'm Amanda Fallis. I'm with the City Archives and Special Collections. We're really grateful to everybody and Mr. Eric Seaferth, uh, curator and historian from the Historic New Orleans Collection. We'll have Mr. Eric speak with uh, Mr. Malik Rahim, the Honorable Edwin Lombard, Mrs. Leona Tate, and Mrs. Dodie Duratha Smith Simmons. And um, with that being said, I would like to turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Amanda, for that introduction and for having us here today. Um, thanks to everyone for coming and uh, spending an hour on your Saturday uh, here at the Public Library. Um, as Amanda said, my name's Eric Seaforth. I'm curator and historian at the Historic New Orleans Collection. We're a museum and research center and publisher in uh, the French Quarter, free uh, to visit every day but Sunday. Um, about a decade ago, we started a program called NOLA Resistance, where we uh, recorded oral histories of people who were participants and activists in the civil rights movement here in New Orleans in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We recorded about 50 hours of interviews uh, that we put online. You can go and listen to all of them from your computer um, at nullresistance.hnoc.org. Um, and then from those, we made a traveling panel exhibition, which is what you see behind me, that is going around town um, with stories of the civil rights movement, where you can learn about some of what happened here in New Orleans, some of the people, and you can also hear their voices. And um, I'm really proud to say that we made this exhibition with uh, input and help from the folks you see at the desk here, um, or on stage rather, and uh, the group of people who gave oral histories. We came together to talk about how the show should look and feel and what the content should be, et cetera. So, um, I'm really proud and um, humbled and honored to be up here with these four legends um, today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna jump in by asking a few questions. So I'm actually gonna start at the far end of the table, if that's all right, Ms. Doty. Uh, <laughs> um, and I wanna take us back to, to, to 1960 because that's a year um, that a lot of the stories started that we have in the exhibition. Um, in the spring of that year, there were actions um, on what is now or at the Castle Haley Boulevard um, to, uh, protest it, to protest unfair hiring practices on the businesses in that strip. And um, later that year, the New Orleans Corps chapter was founded and it kind of came out of that. In the fall of that year, New Orleans public schools were desegregated uh, by Dr. Tate um, and uh, for three other young girls. So we're gonna to get to that story too, but I wanna take it to that year because it's really, I think, a good starting point for so much of what's going on. Uh, Ms. Doty, would you mind telling us a little bit about what CORE was, and then this'll be a, a two-parter, because I'd love to hear your story of, of um, well, let's just start with that. Can you tell us a little bit about what CORE was, how, when you joined, and, and what y'all did? The Congress of Racial Equality was a, a direct nonviolent action group that got started in, I think, 1943. James Former was the National Director of Poor and had been involved in another organization called Four the Federation of Reconciliation that was a pacifist group. And when he left and helped organize the Congress for, at the time it was called a Congress for Racial Equality. Uh, and in 1947, after a ruling on the Irene Morgan case, they decided to do their first bus ride called the Reconciliation, uh, sorry, it was called, uh, when you get my age, you get forgetful. <laughs> and, well, um, I, 
have to tell you the name of it. I'll come back to that later. Anyway, this had to do with Irene Morgan, who had taken a trip to Virginia, and on her way back, got on the bus that was crowded when they did their first stop and some people got off, Irene and another black lady took the seats. But when the new passengers got on, some of them were white, so they were asked to give up their seats so the white people could have the seats. The other lady got up, but Irene Morgan refused to. She said, I paid my fare like everybody else. They called the police. The police got on the bus and said to her, you gotta get off. And she refused. And when he went to grab her arm, she said, don't touch me. So he got off, and she meant it. So he got off the bus, and another police came on and repeated the same thing grabbed her by the arm, and she said, don't touch me. And he continued to try to grab her out of the seat, so she kicked him in the private car. So she was taken off the bus and arrested. Her fine was $500. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and she won it. And the name of that ride was The Journey of Reconciliation. It came back to me. <laughs> and so after the ruling by the Supreme Court, court decided to do their first ride. As you just heard me say, the journey of reconciliation. And they did not go into the deep cell. So that went on. In the 1960s, when the school desegregation was going on. Corps officials from New York came down to New Orleans to observe what was going on. And they participated with a group, the Consumer League, that were boycotting stores on Dry Street. Dry Street was like the Canal Street book black folks, and they would not hire a black person as the cashier. So the Consumer League started boycotting amongst the people who participated with the Consumer League, Rudy Lombard, Jerome Smith, Aretha Castle, Lanny Goldfinch, and a few other people. Core Officials from New York participated, got arrested, and went to jail. While they were here, they decided to organize a chapter here in New Orleans, and that's how New Orleans Corps became. So, one of the first things that New Orleans Corps did was picket Woolworth and Macquarie's on Canal Street. Because they were a new organization and didn't have many members, they came to the NAACP Youth Council meeting, which I was a member of then, not because I believed in what they were doing. Uh, my sister was one of the students who was there. So when they came and asked the NAACP Youth Council to help them, we did. And after a while, the NAACP senior members didn't like what was going on with the picketing. And one of the officials said, if you go to jail, we will not get you out. So a bunch of us got up, walked out, joined Corps, and became the backbone of New Orleans Corps. 
Thank you for that, Ms. Doty. Um, yeah. Um, so later that year, um, in the fall, November 14th of, of 1960, six years after the Brown versus Board decision uh, in the Supreme Court that um, ruled that segregated schools were unconstitutional in the United States, New Orleans finally got around to, and Louisiana, I should say, to desegregating their public schools. And it took a long time, um, but it was also one of the first places in the Gulf South to, to desegregate. Um, so on November 14th, um, there were four young girls at two schools in the city that, um, that desegregated public schools. Um, Dr. Leona Tate, sitting here, was one of them, along with Gail Etienne and Tessie Prevost at McDonough 19 on St. Claude in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, and on the other side of the Industrial Canal, Ruby Bridges um, desegregated William France Elementary. Dr. Tate, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, that day as you experienced it as a first grader. That morning, um, started out as a normal going to school day, um, but I woke up to a house full of family and friends um, just to, I guess, support my mother to prepare for what was coming to us that day. Had no idea what I was about to do. I knew I was going to a new school and I was excited to go to a new school because I hated my old school. <laughs> So we, we seemed to be everybody in a happy spirit, and then all of a sudden a black car pulled up in front of my door. And it was the U.S. Marshals that arrived to drive me to school. Well, that was another exciting moment, because I was walking 11 blocks to my old school. So that, <laughs> that was a luxury to get around, about three or four blocks. And so, uh, I remember approaching the door with my mother and she told me, she said, when you get in the car, sit to the back of the seat and don't put your face to the window. I tell children today, obedience played a big part of what we have to do because we have to listen. And um, I did as I was told and we took the journey, which was not far, it was right in the community where I lived. And um, when I approached the school and we turned on St. Claude Avenue, I just, was masses of people out there just screaming and howling. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And um, me from New Orleans, I thought a parade was coming because that's what <laughs> All the movies. <laughs> I saw the police on horseback holding the crowd back, and that was the only thing that I could relate it to at that time. And, but they did such a good job, no one could get to the side of the street where we approached the building. So we did get to enter the building calmly and um, our parents approached the office to register us and was asked to take a seat on the bench outside of the principal's office. We practically stayed there the whole day before they even decided to place us in the classroom. School was normal, every, every class had students, but once we got placed in the classroom, the parents started coming in, the white parents, and pulling the students out. And by the end of the day, the three of us was the only three students in that entire building, and that lasted for a year and a half. But we had school um, normally. Um, we had a very good caring teacher for the first grade. We had to eat from the school. We had to bring out food. We had to bring out beverages. The windows were papered up. No one could see in. No one could see. We could see out. It was always a, a test for us to try to get to the pencil shelter, and that used to be on the seal of the window, just to see if we could get close to the window. But she was so protective, our teacher at that time, we couldn't get there. But um, the only concern we had was that we couldn't play in the yard. We were never allowed to, to go outside. Um, our play area was right outside the classroom, on the stairwell. And um, if you ever visit the Tep Center, you can see that. And, but we were fine, we were comfortable. Thank you. Um, in, that, in that telling, Dr. Tate mentioned the TEP Center. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, this is the Tate Etienne Prevost Center. Um, it's on St. Claude and in the former McDonough 19 building. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Tate owns this building now, the building she desegregated. And she, which is an amazing story in and of itself, but, but more than that, she uses it to tell the story of civil rights and to fight racism and as a uh, senior housing. So it's a, a really amazing place and it's open to the public and I encourage everyone to go. Dr. Tate is there almost every day and um, it's amazing work that she's doing. So for those of you that were listening closely to, to Ms. Doty, you might have heard her say that uh, Rudy Lombard was one of the founders of CORE. Next to Dr. Tate is Judge Lombard and he grew up with his older brother Rudy on Newton Street in Algiers. Um, and Judge, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what was going on at your house in 1960 um, as CORE was found, being founded and, and those actions were being planned and, and um, kind of what, what your role in all of that was. Well, before we do that, I'm going to break protocol and take judicial notice of an event that happened in New Orleans this week. And I think you all should join me in congratulating our friend, Malik Raheem, the president awarded him a Lifetime Achievement Award this week. Thank you, Eric, for letting me do that. But you didn't know I was going to do it. <laughs> well, I was the, uh, I'm Edwin Lombard, the baby brother of Rudy Lombard, who's the late Rudy Lombard, who went the, uh, if you look at an old letterhead of court, the address is 516 Newton Street. Yeah, headquarters of court, which is still out there. I am what you call a beneficiary of the civil rights movement. I, am, I was a baby at the time, not a baby, a young man, 13, 14 years old. But all of I, I have accomplished, uh, 49 years in elective office and, and doing a lot of stuff in the community came about because of what people did before me. And for what I learned watching the civil rights movement as a young man, I got to meet all kind of luminaries who was coming through 516 during the civil rights movement. One thing I love, I used to love about my brother that he was an inclusive brother. He all the time made sure that I knew what was going on. Some of the issues with what Eric was talking about sometimes um, we used to get threatening phone calls about people going to come by and blow the house up and shoot us and kill us. And we developed a little code that I would answer the phone, and if Mama was near, I would just calmly say, he's not home, or something like that. Of course, she knew what was going on, but I wasn't. And if Mama wasn't home, I would say, bring your ass in this neighborhood here. <laughs> I don't think we ever had anybody drive by New Street to try to bomb us at that point. But I got to uh, witness a whole lot of things, and one of the reasons I am a lawyer, because during that period with Rudy and Jerome dragging me all over around the place, around the country, was one place we used to go to was Collins, Douglas, and Eli, which was at the time probably the first real black uh, law firm. That, uh, that was existing. They had some single lawyers having their offices, but nobody had a firm like that. And they handled most of the civil rights uh, cases in New Orleans, along with Jack Nelson, who handled the Lombard versus Louisiana case in front of the Supreme Court. For those who are not familiar with the old Algiers, before they built the bridge, Algiers was a city unto itself. We, the bridge was built somewhere around 1958, 1959, but before that we had to travel by ferries. And it was a unique kind of community. It was, it was really a community of integrated community. Most of the Newton Street area was comprised of blacks and probably Italians. And I guess I was 14 before I realized St. Joseph Day was an Italian holiday. <laughs> and we all used to, to go around it. So, um, and one, one event happened in Algiers in the early 50s, like 1952, 52, 53, that Ronnie Moe, who was a, was a member of CORE and probably one of the most underrated civil rights workers to come out of New Orleans. And if you ever get a chance to look at the film, The CORE Diaries, you could see Ronnie Moore and what he did during those periods. But Ronnie Moore said that the reason I didn't go to jail when I was six years old is because when the police came to the playground, at the, which is now the old playground, to arrest them for playing in it, they ran me home. But that was the beginning of Rudy's activism. 
they had a playground. All Saints Church is located on Tash Street. The next to it is a big playground that was segregated. And we as kids who went to All Strength School had to play in the street. We could not go in the playground next to the school. And one day, as often happens when we were playing ball, Rudy and Ronnie Moore in that group, the ball went in the park. They decided to go get the ball in the park. And then they decided to play ball in the park. And of course, the white neighbors called the police. And the police came by and bring 10 or 15 of these youth, elementary school children to the first 4th District Police Station in Alabama which was insane. They didn't arrest them, but what they tried to get them to admit that the priest put them up to that so they could go and arrest the priest. Well, that did not work. So, as I said, you know, when you're looking at the uh, cases, and, and this is the 60th anniversary, anniversary of Freedom Summer. This is also the 10th anniversary of the death of my brother. But before he died, we went to Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, this was a very emotional thing for him as I stood next to him in front of the church and in front of the, the grave site, not the grave sites, the, the original burial sites of Goodman, Chain, and Swerner and watched him. Uh, just could not hold anymore and have him tell me the stories. And we have a lot of untold stories and at one point I tried to get the stories told. And Dodie can tell you what's called. I, when I went to Tulane, I went back to get my bachelor's degree in 2013. Yeah, I was a lawyer without a bachelor's degree. And my project was the Freedom Riders of New Orleans. And you can see it on C-SPAN and you can see the other stuff. Well, I got some of these people to tell their own stories. Like Matt Suarez never tells his story. Matt Suarez was in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and he was a field director in Philadelphia, Mississippi. So you got him to tell his story. And a lot of those people, they are no longer with us, Gene, and the rest of them. But at any rate, I don't, we could go on and on, but I want to save some time for some questions and, and some other stuff. But again, I've been blessed, and I was blessed by people going out there and putting their lives on the line, which allowed me the opportunity to serve this this city for 30, 49 years. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. All right, Mr. Rahim. Do you want to... So we're going to move um, chronologically through the 60s here. Attorney Ernest Jones, will you stand up? Yeah. Whoa. Attorney Ernest Jones represented the Black Panther Party of New Orleans in the shootout in Desire. He didn't know only represent us. He was our first attorney. He was, he was dead a day the night before to try to negotiate a peace between the New Orleans police and uh, members of the NCCF. He was dead. And he had paid a cost for that. I mean, look at look, uh, When you're looking at him, then you look at Cot and, and see what these attorneys have cost. When I look every time I'm around him, you know, I give grace to him because I know that if it wasn't for him, because it, it, it was him that got Lil C line involved. So without them, God knows what would have happened. And so, uh, and I'm sorry, I, uh, I didn't see you back then, my brother. Unfortunately, we just had services a couple of Saturdays ago for Charlie. For, 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 for Charlie Cotton, who remember that love for her. Eric? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Rahim. We have about 10 minutes left. I'm hoping we can stretch that a little bit, but I'd like to ask everyone one more question. Well, before we start, 
I just read an article in the paper about this new developer is going to come down, come to New Orleans. They're about to do the Mayflower Hotel. Anybody saw that on Canal Street, where McCrory's used to be? We still don't have a mark about McCrory's or about Woolworth, where the first sit-ins were. They put the Hard Rock Cafe, the Hard Rock Hotel that fell down, boy. I tell you, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> because he refused to put a marker there. They did not want to put a marker on Rampart Street where the first sit-in was. The second sit-in was at McCrory's right down where they're going to develop and knock it down again. I think it's time for us to start raising our voices and say, listen, he's going to put some markers down, put some in his room, well, let's do it. The Attorney General came through down with a lick in the prayer. He decided where well, he was going to put markers where he had no rhyme or reason to it. So I think it's, it's, it's necessary that we preserve our history. Right. I'm sorry. Thank you for that, Judge. Um, I couldn't agree more. Ms. Doty, I wonder if uh, we could go back to you and your work with CORE, and specifically I'd like to ask you to tell about your experience as a tester riding to uh, Macomb, Mississippi, to see if the Greyhound bus terminal was uh, in line with the ICCF ruling to uh, integrate. That came about right after Jerome Smith got out of parchment, out of jail in Mississippi during the Freedom Ride. And he decided that we should go to Macomb. So Jerome, Alice Thompson, George Raymond, Thomas Valentine, and myself that left New Orleans on November 29, 1961. And when we got there to the bus terminal in Macomb, it was closed. They said it was a gas leak. So we went into the black community to a place called the White Castle Hotel and Cafe. Around noon time, we went back to the terminal. When we did test rides, we had an observer. The observer was Jerome Smith and the testers. The testers were the other four. So Jerome let off the bus first, tried to get into the terminal. There was an elderly white man pushing against the door to keep Jerome out. When somebody needed to get out, he had to move and that's how Jerome got in. After a couple of minutes, Jerome being inside the terminal, the other four of us came into the terminal. We went directly to the counter, of the, to the lunch counter, and sat down. George Raymond said to the waitress, may I have a cup of coffee, please? She ignored him. Again, he said, may I have a cup of coffee, please? At this point, a young white Mississippian went up to the coffee machine, poured out a hot cup of coffee, walked around the back of George Raymond, poured a hot cup of coffee over his head, and hit him in the base of the neck with the coffee cup. At that point, all hell broke out. It took Tom Valentine off the stool, lifted him in the air, and threw him down on the ground, and he bounced up like a rubber ball. <laughs> they did that several times, and I don't know how he did it. George Raymond, they start chasing. Here is the lunch counter, had a foot-long part glass partition. They came around to chase him. George Raymond jumped over that glass partition, they ran it back around to get him. He jumped back over it. <laughs> and I thought this should be an Olympic event because he would have won. I don't know how he did it. So that went on. Jerome motioned for Alice and I to come sit in the waiting area. At this point, they figured out Jerome was part of the group. And they started beating on him with brass knuckles. They beat Jerome so bad that he suffered from that beating to this day. And that went on. 
And as I say, when I went on these campaigns, I always took a notepad with me. And I was writing down what was happening. This is the note here from Mahone, Mississippi. And I was singing in my head, we are not afraid, while writing, we are not afraid. The guys were being beaten, and Jerome was taking such a severe beating by these young white guys from Macomb, Mississippi. Where does the hate come from? Why? So, I don't know how Jerome got out of the terminal, or for that matter, the, the other guys. So, Alice and I were the only two left in the waiting room. And we looked at each other, and I guess we decided at the same time, we better get the hell out of here. <laughs> On the way out, I was kicked in the back by the same guy who was beat Jerome with the brass knuckles. Alice was kicked in the side. And Alice did not weigh 100 pounds. There were three Thompson sisters, and they were all under 100 pounds. And when we got out, we start running. Jerome was in front of me. I was behind him. I looked around to see who was behind me. And there was Tom Valentine trying to get into a black taxi cab, being drugged out by white thugs and kicked in the body part in the head. I do not know what happened to Alice or George Raymond. While we were running, Jerome in front of me, a pickup truck passed by, driven by a black man. So Jerome dove into the back of the truck. And I looked around, and there's nobody but me. And I thought, I always say that I was collectively, I was never, never afraid. But on my own, I was scared half to death. I had no idea what to do. Something told me to turn this corner and run back toward the terminal. And I don't know why I did that, because I thought that was crazy. But when I got there, let me say this to you, when we first got there, we did not see one black person. But when I ran down that hill to the colored entrance of the terminal, black folks were standing out, and they encircled me. I owe my life today to those people in Macomb, Mississippi. One lady said that she could hear my heart beating. So I say to myself, Dodie, you're going to stand in this crowd and calm yourself down. Then walk out of here and up the hill like you're going to clean Miss Ann's kitchen. And when you get out of sight, run like hell. <laughs> And that's what I did, not realizing that I was in a white community, never been to Macomb, Mississippi in my life, don't know where I was running to, but that's what I was going to do, and I ran. Then I heard my name, Jody. I said, how these white folks know my name? <laughs> and I ran faster. And I heard my name again, Jody. And the adrenaline cooked in. I was told that I outran that truck for about 15 or 20 blocks. And I say to myself, if they're going to kill me, they got to catch me. And then the truck overtook me. And I thought, oh, my God. But then people from my group got out. And I stopped, and I wanted to cry. But I said, I'm not going to cry. Because I'm not afraid now. So we got in the truck, went back to the White Castle Hotel and Cafe, was treated by a Dr. James Anderson. And after he had finished treating Jerome, Jerome turned to me and said, Get Bobby Kennedy on the phone. 
And I looked at him like, man, you have one too many hits. <laughs> he repeated again, get Bobby Kennedy on the phone. So, like I said, I had my pen and my paper. He called out this number. Until two years ago, I thought that was Bobby Kennedy's direct line. Because when I called that number, I expected a secretary to pick up the phone. But this man answered the phone, and I said, May I speak to Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, please? He say, this is he. And I go, whoa. <laughs> I thought a secretary would ask, he got a secretary? And I say, my name is Dorota Smith, and I'm calling for Jerome Smith. He say, I'm aware of the situation. There are FBI agents out front waiting to take you back to New Orleans. Being all of 18 and a half, I say to the Attorney General, oh, no, they won't. <laughs> We're going back to New Orleans the way we came, by bus. And I handed the phone to Jerome. And later on, I heard Jerome say the same thing, we go going by bus. Because when we were in the tournament and the guys were getting beat, there was not one not two, not three, but 10 FBI agents watching us being beat. And they didn't do a thing. And they want to take me back to New Orleans? <laughs> How do I know the agent I'm from Macomb and a Klan's member? So we stayed at the White Castle Hotel and Cafe. That evening when the bus was supposed to leave, we took, we went back to the bus terminal. When we got to Macomb, we did not see one police officer. When we got back to the terminal, it was swarming with police. And we looked at each other, and without saying anything, it looked like we were saying, we're not ready for another beating. So we asked the taxi driver to take us to the highway. So we got out on the highway, and when the bus came, we stood on the highway flagging the bus down. And that's how we got back to New Orleans. When we, when we got back to New Orleans, who was outside the bus terminal waiting for us? The FBI agent wanted us to come to FBI headquarters to give our statement. We say, we'll call you when we are ready. <laughs> Jerome is bleeding like crazy. This is us coming back. Jerome, you can see they patched up his ear. And we did not go. In a couple of days, I called and went and gave my statement. Then they want to tell me, how did I know it was Brass Knuckles? I'm from the Ninth Ward. <laughs> I know what Brass Knuckles look like. Yeah, okay. How you know it wasn't a ring? A ring couldn't have done all that damage to Jerome. But we made it back, and like I say, the rest is history. And it was something I would never, ever forget. These young white mothers with babies on their hips in the crowd hollering, kill those kill those Where does the hate come from? That's what I wondered all these years. Why were they out there with them babies to begin with? It's amazing. But I would never, ever regret taking that ride on November 29, 1961, 18 and a half years. I've turned that 18 around to 81. I am now 81 years young.
Thank you so much for sharing that story. I'm in awe every time I hear it of your, your bravery and, and um, conviction, especially as an 18-year-old, to, to do that. You know, it's virtually impossible to tell a story now. And it's, it's you know, we only thank uh, the sponsors of this program for putting it on, and thank you all for coming out on a hot Saturday afternoon. But it would take uh, everybody at this table another eight hours to tell you the true story. So we would encourage that you go and look at the exhibit. We'd also encourage that you look at the, the, the uh, this YouTube thing on Freedom Riders in New Orleans, and you can get, I think it was 12 Freedom Riders from New Orleans who are telling their stories. So you could get that. There are many more players in this struggle. And you, we can't do it any justice in this hour, but we can just give you a little bit about it. We want to thank everybody for putting this together, and, and particularly for inviting me here. You know, I'm the, I'm the baby of this group. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I remember the day when, when y'all went to school, so I, I, am not, I am not the baby. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, if if, if y'all don't mind, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Tate one more question before uh, we um, break to, to um, end the program and have a chance to talk to each other uh, in the library space. Does that sound all right? Um, so... Dr. Tate, you were at McDonough 19 for a year and a half. It was just the three of you, um, Gail and Tessie, at the school. All the other teachers were there, um, but there were no other students. And, and that lasted for a year and a half before you, you moved to a different school. Um, I think, you know, you, you stayed on the front lines of desegregation and desegregating public schools in New Orleans through through high school, I believe. And so it wasn't just that first day, November 14th, or that first day, first year, um, where you made this historic moment, but you really did it year after year after year after year, because in New Orleans, the plan was to have one grade at a time, and you led that effort. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, when they decided to desegregate the schools, they didn't open up all the grades. The grades were integrated as we progressed the grade. Once we reached 10th grade, then it was opened up through our 12th grade. And I guess those efforts was, suppose we would have failed. It wouldn't have worked. But um, so after second grade at McDonald 19, McDonald 19 had become a school for Negro children. That's how they said it then. So we were transferred, Tessa Gale and I were transferred to Sims. But this time we didn't have the marshals or the police protection. We had to endure a lot Whoa. at Sims in order for it to work. I only lasted at Sims a year because you had to go to school in the area where we lived. And my family moved. I joined Ruby at France in fourth grade. Same division. Was more black students there then, but it was still white and black division. And we stayed there until sixth grade and then went to junior high school, Joseph Cone Junior High School in the ninth ward. And we faced it again there, you know. But after so many years of seeing the same thing, you just get accustomed to just seeing those things go on. But the, you got older and the fighting got worse, you know, in school. You know. It's a lot of rioting. And then our senior year was at Nichols. Nichols mascot was Rebels, and they honored the Confederate flag. So that was total chaos, even when we hit the door there. Um, it, it, it was horrific. I couldn't even imagine sending a child of this day to a school like that. But they weren't for change, and they were against change. But it had to be done, you know. My junior year, we requested to have the mascot changed. And um, it took a lot. More white flight, more fighting. It was, it was not a place in the building you can go to without there being a crowd fighting. But the mascot did change, thanks to, to a lot of our local politicians that helped us to do that. And um, today, 
the name has changed now to Frederick Douglass, but it still has the same mascot, Bobcats. Now, a little, little known fact. Did you know that there were schools uptown New Orleans that had volunteered to integrate? That the school board deliberately picked those schools, knew they were going to be the confrontation. They knew they picked the lower night ward and the upper night ward to integrate schools. There were uptown white folk uptown prepared to take students in their schools, and they turned them down. Period. There was no upper, uh, lower down. But yeah, that that was a deliberate act. They they, they predict they knew what was going to happen by integrating those two schools. Before we wrap up and um, open the floor, I want to ask if anyone would like a moment to have any um, closing remarks, starting with you, Mr. Rahim. I took up uh, too much of your time. <laughs> so I'm going to apologize and just say that uh, we had some very scary times. It's a prediction that by 2050, New Orleans might be an undisappeared. <laughs> We are here. We have the solutions. We're in a city with less than 400,000, with seven colleges and universities. Tell me we can't come up with some solution. Again, thank you. Again, I want, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the sponsors. And, I'm, and you're looking at the poster boy for a blessed child. The young man from Algiers used to sit on the levee and watch the ships go. I could tell you the name of the tugboats. That was my hobby. And I said to myself, one day I would like to go to those places. And then, lo and behold, I become clerk of court, first African-American to conduct elections in the country. And as a result of that, I got to do elections all over the world. I did elections in South Africa, I did elections in Indonesia, I did elections in, in Bosnia, I did Dayton Peace Accord. Uh, so for those people who went before me, I want to thank you all, because you all made it possible for me to get where I got. And you know, it's, I'm honored to be sitting at the table with you all. Thank you. I would like to thank Eric and the historic New Orleans collection for putting the trail they blaze together and making sure that it gets around to people. I would like to thank the New Orleans Public Library for making sure that this event happened today. I would like to thank parents who brought their kids out today. The civil rights movement is not being taught in public schools. And when you have the opportunity to come out to hear those who were involved and to bring the children, I think it's an A plus. Thank you for coming. Thank the rest of you for coming. Stories are being told every day at the Tep Center. Monday through Friday from 10 to 2, you're welcome to visit. This exhibit was the first site for this, the Tep Center was the first site for this exhibit. And this is what the Tep Center is about. Not just about the school desegregation, it's about every movement that happened in the Williams. And they need to know that. Thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you for being here and sharing your stories today and for sharing your stories in the exhibit and everything y'all have done and continue to do to make our city a better place. And thank everybody for coming. Um, so thanks all for coming.